I'm so excited to be talking to Roya about this incredible book. Um, as you can see, I've posted, <laughs> noted it throughout with so many passages that I just wanted to remember and revisit and um, talk to you about. It's such a searingly beautiful book. I feel like um, you could open it up at any page and really come away with incredible insights about being in America, uh, being an American that, as Cindy said, we so often take for granted um, living here um, because it's so much the air we breathe and the water we swim in. Um, so I just wanted to open up our discussion, Roya, by asking you, because you made a very, I'm sure, deliberate choice to write the book um, in second person, mm -hmm. which is, I think, um, a curious choice, but it has you know, it has a lot of um, potential. I'm sure you have your reasons. So I would love to hear from you um, how you came to that decision. Sure. Um, first of all, hi to Cindy, who reached out to you, um, a fellow author and poet, and to everybody else who's joined us on this very, very wet evening. Um, and I want to say that um, there is something, um, that feels very intimate to me when um, I am in conversation with people from, uh, you know, my own community. And even though I'm in Woodbridge, I uh, go back and forth to Wallingford almost on a daily basis because I have a son in school there. Um, so it's a it's a great pleasure to be in conversation um, with with a fellow poet and uh, and be in attendance with members of the community. Thank you. Um, and, and by the way, uh, both your introductions deeply touch me because, um, you know, it's not enough when you read um, praises uh, of your book or reviews of um, your book in print. There's something, uh, there's something distant, um, however flattering it might be uh, about that. There's something entirely um, far more touching and compelling when you, you know, listen to um, people who are serious readers, um, you know, showing with their words that they have connected with the book as uh, Cindy just put. So uh, that made me feel really good. Now, uh, the decision to choose uh, the second person address um, was deliberate and um, and, and there's one main, um, there was one main idea behind it. I decided to write this book in 2016 when so many, um, so many poisonous comments and, uh, and debates were going on about immigrants, who they are, why they come, what, how they shouldn't come, why they shouldn't come why we need to keep them out, why we need to be, build walls, why you know, immigrants could be dangerous, you know, or you know, in, in one instance, our country was full, we couldn't have more of them, or we should have you know, the ones who come from Norway, but not the ones who come from <laughs> those other countries like you know, Iran, which I happen to come from. Um, so I was hearing all this and like, I'm sure many of you, um, I was um, I was getting angry as an as an American, but a part of me, the immigrant in me, was feeling incredibly afraid. I know it's irrational, and the reason I decided to write the book was because I had suddenly this irrational feeling that you know I should do something that that there was a threat and um, and I. You know, I had been a naturalized citizen by 2016 for many, many years. I had no reason to worry, but but there was a fear that that somehow had been awakened in me, and and in response to this, many other people were writing books defending immigrants or or attacking immigrants and immigration, and I just decided that it wasn't for me to be on either side. Of, of this debate, that, that my job wasn't to overtly participate 
in the you know, policy conversation that, that the best thing I could do was to try to bring people really, really, really close to how the immigrant um, arrives, what the immigrant feels, what is going on through the mind of the immigrant, how the immigrant feels, what the immigrant's anxieties are. And I thought if I do all this, then maybe the immigrant, rather than being an object of conversation, becomes a human being, which the immigrant was not, you know, when, when everybody was, you know, just having, you know, going at this, um, at the immigrant in this very, very um, hostile and partisan way. So I thought if I write in the first person, as I had done in my memoir, it would become yet another single account um, that could easily be dismissed. You know, I couldn't uh, possibly speak on behalf of people more than myself because I'm just offering a personal account. And I worried that if I write in the third person, which I had done in my second book, it would sound like a piece of journalism. And, and I would blend in with so much else that was being written. Um, and I wanted to strike a voice that was very distinct from all the other people who were contributing to this conversation. And, and so I thought maybe the second person uh, would, be, would be that very distinct voice, but also maybe um, through that, I could bring people um, really in, inside that experience. And, and I thought as, as a refugee and an immigrant myself, that would be the most meaningful contribution I could make. I'll make the other answers shorter. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. That was a great answer. And I think that, I mean, I think it was, it's clear as you're reading the book, what the second person is doing for you um, as you're telling the story. And one thing that I really um, admired, because I often write in second person, is that usually second person is just sort of a, a proxy for first person, right? You're just sort of putting your experience um, onto somebody else, some hypothetical yeah. you, but it's clear you're talking from one persona. But you beautifully and seamlessly, I think, capture a lot of different refugee and immigrant experiences simply by saying, and if you happen to come from this kind of country, or if you happen to have arrived in America this way. Mm -hmm. And I felt like you really seamlessly brought together all of these different experiences mm -hmm. into this one second person who you know, is a singular person. So I thought that that was really um, wonderfully done. Thank you. I mean, um, part of it was because, um, I mean, I gave myself that permission because it, I mean, when I heard words like, we should bring more people from Norway, <laughs> I, I thought only somebody who has never been an immigrant could possibly think that if you are uprooted like that, you know, in, in the way that, for instance, my mother and I were uprooted or people who are arriving from Afghanistan these days have been uprooted, you know, uprooted through a, a, an existential crisis, right? Um, you know, forced out like so many others uh, at the Mexican border are now forced out due to, you know, severe violence and, um, you know, other economic and um, environmental uh, crises. Only someone who has never been um, forced out of their own home could possibly think that it makes a difference under those circumstances, whether you are from this country or that country, that in some ways, what makes us, what drives us all out, brings us to, to a fundamentally shared experience, which turns us all into, um, into uh, f into people who share far more than, than they don't. And, and so I think at some point when, when we are all driven out and when we arrive here, not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, having to start a life from scratch, we are a lot more similar than we are different. And I, I wanted to emphasize that. And I thought, mm, you know, there are overlapping experiences that the you 
um, or the voice of um, whoever it was that I was channeling, you know, no matter where that immigrant was coming from, uh, could capture. And, and it was important to me to emphasize that, that we as immigrants have far more in common than those who want to distinguish us by virtue of our, you know, race or ethnicity or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you, so, Bora, you mentioned a little bit about how you came here. It was with your mother, and Cindy talked a little bit about when you came here um, as a teenager. But the book doesn't really get into your um, your personal experience. Do you mind just sharing a little bit about how you came here and when um, with, with our Zoom audience? Oh, sure. Um, as Cindy said, I, I put some of that into a memoir that came out in 2004. Um, but, but the story was that, um, you know, I was born and raised in Iran. And uh, in 1979, a revolution swept through Iran. And I'm sure many people remember because it, uh, it not only transformed Iran, but, you know, it, it deeply affected uh, the Middle East and uh, and of course, you know, the relationship between Iran and the United States um, has since been, you know, uh, uh, different than they used to be and hostile uh, for that matter. And, um, um, and after about five years uh, living under uh, sort of the shadow of that revolution and, and a war that ensued between Iran and Iraq, uh, after 1979, it appeared that, you know, we, we as a family couldn't be whole again because my brothers were in the United States studying and they could not come back because they would have been drafted um, and, and sent to war. Um, so my parents decided that um, in order to be reunited with my brothers, we should leave Iran. Uh, my mother and I left in 1984. We were refugees for about a year in Europe. And uh, in 1985, we arrived in the United States uh, on asylum. Um, and, and uh, you know, watching the events in Afghanistan and, um, you know, the flood of refugees from Afghanistan to the United States, uh, I'm often reminded uh, of how much the circumstances uh, that drove us out uh, are were in common um, and are in common with what's uh, driven out the Afghan refugees uh, from Afghanistan. And I, uh, in some ways in the past two, three months, I feel like I've, I'm watching my own life replay uh, once more. One, one of the things that you do um, so powerfully in the book is is address this, I think, what is a really common feeling that some Americans have who may be less empathetic or sympathetic to immigrants is talk about how um, there's a sort of sense that refugees should just be grateful that mm -hmm. <laughs> they've been allowed to come here and to stay here. And you really capture um, beautifully how um, Obviously, there's so much more beneath the surface than just that gratitude. Sure, there's gratitude there, but there's that entire life um, before that has been completely lost, um, not to mention the trauma of what happened um, in the mother country. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your personal experience in you know, dealing with that, with that schism. Sure. You know, it's, it's very... Um, it, it, you know, I, I was a new immigrant in America, you know, 30 plus years ago. And, and so many details are not available to me, but the emotional details are, um, are, are so very available. And, <clears throat> and when I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, gather material for the book, I talked to a lot of new immigrants and um, I asked them, you know, so, you know, what, what were your initial months like? And it, it was so <laughs> liberating. Uh, and maybe it's because, you know, misery loves company. <clears throat> but I loved hearing every one of them say, I arrived and it was as if 
for weeks and weeks, I was walking through fog. That the, the degree of disorientation was so much that it, it wasn't that you were just physically jet lagged, you were also emotionally, uh, intellectually jet lagged too, that there was, there was a, uh, uh, there, somehow your circumstances of how you felt and where you were on the inside didn't match the world outside. Um, and there was this huge discrepancy that you had to live through. And, and, and that's what I remember. And that's, um, you know, and I remember during this time where I am, I am really somewhere else, even though I'm physically here, um, you know, my mind, my thoughts, my feelings, my, it, you know, it, everything that, um, that engages me in every other way uh, was, was left behind, you know, was, was, was still engaged in that other world I'd left behind. And while everybody was <clears throat> wonderful people who were trying to uh, make me, you know, settle in in this new life, help me, um, you know, open a bank account, get a social security card, everybody was expecting me to, you know, move on, you know, go to work. In, in fact, two weeks after I had arrived in America um, and didn't speak a word of English, they, I was sent to, um, <laughs> to take a job at a you know, denture manufacturing company uh, in New York City. And, and, um, and Cindy is right, I did arrive at, J at JFK and those initial images that I offer are from JFK airport. Uh, and so they sent me to New York City to, to this denture making company. And, uh, and just because I was 18 and probably looked like, you know, I was energetic and, um, and you know, what young person couldn't possibly speak English, somebody must have thought. They sent me to this job and, <laughs> and I was supposed to answer phone calls and, you know, route calls to between whoever it was that, uh, you know, was calling to whoever it was that he or she wanted to speak to. So, you know, I remember picking up the phone and they would say, can I speak to Bob? And I would say, repeat. And they would say, Bob. And I would say, spell please. And they would say, B-O-B. And... And I wanted, so, so by then I understood that he wanted to speak to Bob, but I didn't know who he was. And I didn't have the words to say, so who are you? And so the only option that I thought at the time being 18, I had was to hang up. So I would hang up and then the second call would come in, what, repeat, John, you know, spell, you know. And then after about two days, um, I got fired, you know, it, it was, it was a very, very compassionate <laughs> process of firing, but I got fired. But the, but the point being that when, when you are so disoriented, when there is so much that you can't possibly catch up on, um, during that very period, people were asking me, aren't you delighted to be in America? Don't you think this is really wonderful? And it just really pissed me off. It wasn't because I wasn't grateful or, you know, I hadn't even lifted my head enough to look at this space, to register where I was, to, to think that the things around me were things that I should be grateful for because I really wasn't available to, to these experiences yet. And, and the fact that everybody in the midst of all that was going on was expecting me to then, you know, like a, like a good puppy jump and, you know, say those things, the right words or be grateful or fetch or whatever really offended me. And so I, I, it was very lucky that I didn't have enough English to snap back because I was really ready uh, to snap back. And nowadays when people ask me, you know, so what should we do um, as a community when we encounter immigrants? Um, my only, my best advice is to say, let them be, you know, uh, 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 you know, cease expectations. Um, don't demand, just be around them. Don't even try to do too much because just being here is a whirlwind 
for them. Um, and it's just enough to be at their side and try to bring a sense of calm and peace to, to someone who is going through so much that they cannot even articulate. Um, and that's really my, my best advice. Thank you, Roy. As you were talking, I was thinking about how even now my parents were immigrants and they've been here since the 60s. And even now, I think when people talk to them, there is that sort of implication in the way that they talk to my parents that they should be grateful. And I feel like my parents sort of bring up their energy when they talk to non-Chinese friends of theirs, you know, to sort of perform that gratitude that we're here, you know, that we've been accepted. And my mother still asks me all the time, you know, do they accept you? Do they accept you? You know, like we're still, we're still yeah. foreign. You know? That's really funny because uh, I received uh, your mother's uh, statement to you reminds me of something my mother said to me. Um, Elle magazine gave me uh, the nonfiction of the year award, the year that um, my memoir came out. And my mother, it, they, they had a little party it was sort of a mini gala and 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 by the way when the you know the description of the, the competition because it was a reader's choice uh competition so you know out of the 500 readers who had read an overwhelming number had chosen my memoir so it wasn't even close um you know between the second person who who was after me um, so my mother came to that ceremony and she spoke very poor English, but, but she knew that, you know, a bunch of Americans who were non-immigrants were giving her daughter an award. So she walked up to every single person on the stage and said, thank you for encouraging my daughter. <laughs> thank you for encouraging me, my daughter. I can't, I, to this day, I remember that she couldn't believe that I had actually won something uh, on the basis of the work I'd done, but that, you know, they were trying to say uh, that, you know, that this immigrant is good and we like her. So we gave her this thing, even though uh, she hadn't really earned it. Um, and I was standing there, I thinking, it's a good thing I'm not 18 or 19, because this would really embarrass and infuriate me. But um, I was older and I was able to stand there and register it as you have registered, you know, your mother's anxiety um, about whether or not, you know, you're accepted. I think my mother was saying to everyone, you know, thank you for accepting my daughter and giving her this little statue. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so now that I know that you came here pretty late, I mean, as a, as an older teenager, even, um, I'm even more impressed by, by your English in, in this novel, I mean, in this memoir in particular, because it's just, it's, it's not just flawless, it's lyrical and it's really beautiful. Um, your prose is just eminently, eminently readable. Um, it's just a really, it's a pleasure to read. Um, and I know um, a lot of people, a lot of writers have talked about this, about um, how they have different personalities in different languages. So I, wonder, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about learning English and how you came to, you know, not only become fluent, but find a voice and a style in English, which, you know, many native speakers have difficulty doing. Um, but then also, if you could talk about whether or not you write in Farsi and what um, what the differences might be between the two. Um, that's an excellent uh, and a very rich question because um, it's one of the things I constantly think about. I think about who I am in Persian um, and who I am in English and what the differences are between these two voices. Um, and then um, I know exactly what I need to take from my English voice um, to the Persian speaking wor world, uh, because it doesn't exist there. 
and the other way around, you know, what I can in, import from that, you know, linguistic universe into this because it doesn't exist here. So it's been, uh, it's been sort of a, uh, a very uh, interesting role of being interlocutor um, by way of kind of connecting to two languages in such a way. Um, I actually, since you're a poet, I should say that uh, the first person who actually gave me uh, a pass to write in English was Allen Ginsberg at Brooklyn College, whom I studied with <clears throat> um, when I um, was in graduate school uh, at Brooklyn College for a year. And um, I hadn't written anything in English except, um, and the only thing I had to present was uh, a book of poems in Persian. And uh, he required 35 um, poems um, for anyone who wanted to apply to be his student. So um, I just really, really wanted um, to finally dare and, you know, study English literature because um, that's really what I wanted to do, even though I had talked myself into um, studying psychology as an undergrad, thinking, you know, this language wasn't for me. I couldn't, I could not possibly master it. So I went to Allen Ginsberg's office and I said, uh, you know, can I uh, come to your class? And he said, do you have the 35 poems? And I gave him my book of po poetry in Persian. <laughs> and he took the book, he looked at it, he perused it and he said, groovy. You know, he didn't say, <laughs> He didn't say, you know, I can't read this. I don't know if you're good enough. He just said, you're in. <laughs> it, was, it was such an Allen thing to do. And uh, I was delighted, obviously. I went to the class and he gave us a first assignment. Now, this, this, this kind of answers um, some of your question. Um, he, he gave us an assignment. Um, I wrote it. And then... Um, he marked up uh, the pages and gave, it, gave them back to us. And he came over me to give me my paper and it was all, he had marked it all up in red. And he said, I'm really disappointed. Uh, this is all cliche. And I sat there overjoyed because all I was trying to do was sound like everybody else. I wasn't trying to be original. I just wanted to make sure that I sounded like an American and that, you know, I, you know, I, nobody would look at this and say, ah, oh, this is, this is a carpetbagger. This is somebody from a different language, you know, trying to, um, you know, trying to come into our language and write in English. But the moment he said, this is all cliche, I thought, great, this is so reassuring. You know, I was sounding like, like an American. And he was very puzzled by my reaction because I, I took, took what he thought was a criticism as a complete compliment. <laughs> um, and, um, and then, you know, by, by the end of the term, I think he knew where I was coming from. I knew what he expected of me, um, but I think he understood that he needed to give me more time. I think in the end, um, of what, what really helped me develop a voice um, was, was the certainty that I had, uh, I had been through experiences that were important to talk about. I had a conviction about the things that I had been through, I had witnessed, and, and that were important to kind of tell the world about them. And I think that conviction uh, really uh, was very key in enabling me to uh, to sit at my desk with a sense that um, whatever else I may get wrong, um, I had something important to say, and that confidence kind of uh, enabled me to uh, find a voice to take myself seriously, which is, as I'm sure you know, um, is a is a key part of um, you know sitting down at at writing anything. Absolutely. That's so amazing that you study with Allen Ginsberg. <laughs> wow. 
I went to a reading of his um, when I was an undergrad and that was, it was just wonderful to even be close to him um, in that kind of context. It was. Yeah. He was uh, really a very memorable person um, and he, he didn't, he had no heirs. He uh, felt like another equal in some ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, we knew that he had knowledge to impart on us, but in every other way, we sat with him as if, um, you know, we were just uh, a group of people who were interested in literature. It was beautiful. That's amazing. I love that. It's yeah. wonderful. Um, Roy, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I think is called sort of third culture by certain people. Um, in the diaspora chapter of, of your book, um, you talk about the assimilation process when you begin to stop recognizing aspects of your old life or um, the country that you came from and start to feel like an American to the extent that you now can help new refugees and immigrants. And you give an example of helping um, a couple in the grocery store aisle who is confused by um, a frozen food item. Can you talk a little bit about this gnawing that you cannot articulate? Those are your words. Um, sort of the loss of the old self and becoming the new one, but still feeling uneasy and not really. I think that's the hard part where you're no longer in any realm, right? You're sort of of this realm, but still not really of this realm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder where you are now, how do you feel now um, in that in that journey? This is a it's great. I think um, some of what has, um, you know, if we want to call it assimilation, although um, I know we have trouble with that term nowadays, um, came as a result of um, becoming a mom. You know, I think there's a way in which um, a, a, a baby, a child, um, becomes a passport into uh, into starting in America from the very, very beginning. Um, and I remember that um, my children weren't interested in, in the kid books, you know, children's literature as much as I was. I was fascinated. I, I read more of those books than they were interested <laughs> <laughs> to me, interested in me having, um, you know, reading it to them, because it was just um, allowing me to uh, enter America through um, this, the experience of a child as if I was, um, I was starting fresh too. I was, you know, a kid who was born here and who was going to school here. And, and so in some ways, uh, I think I have been far more of an American because of them in the past 14, 15 years than I ever was, you know, in the first 15 years. Um, but I think at the same time, um, I don't know why people are worried about, you know, the immigrant or whoever comes from another culture losing uh, his or her culture because um, these things are, <clears throat> are actually, um, not easy um, to, to lose because they're not simply inside the language, they're not simply inside, uh, you know, those overt practices, they are so ingrained in who we are, uh, how we think, how we, um, you know, dream even, that they are almost impossible to shed. And, um, and those are the ways in which I see that, um, you know, if I speak English for, you know, a, a, an extended period of time, I start to feel uncomfortable as if I have an itch, you know, um, it's, it's almost physical and I need to find someone to speak Persian to. It's, it's as if, you know, that some, there's some kind of in, inner equilibrium that, that needs to, that I need to keep. Uh, otherwise it, it becomes too much to, Handle. And the other way around, I mean, I, if I'm within a Persian speaking community for too long, um, I start to really 
feel like I need to um, be in that other world, speak that other language, be around you know, people who, who are different because both communities give me things um, that the other doesn't. Um, you know, there, there are ways in which um, the Iranian community gives me a sense of warmth, <clears throat> intimacy, uh, a bond to the past that, you know, that my American community can't give me. And the American community fills me with a sense of purpose, with a sense of, uh, you know, a possibility that uh, clearly the Iranian community couldn't give me because if the sense of possibility existed, I wouldn't be here. So it's all uh, it's a, it's a it it's all a, a, a double existence that um, that can be uh, burdensome uh, or it can be equally uh, enriching depending on um, you know where I am on a particular day. Uh, but oftentimes I think uh, the the older I have grown. Um, the, the more I have celebrated it, because I think being these multi-dimensional people, as I'm sure you experience yourself as a Chinese American, um, is, is in some ways a, um, a, a deeply enriching uh, way to be, you know, to, to know that, um, you know, you're, you're bifocal, you know, as opposed to... Um, yes, you know. yeah looking at things straight. It's, it's true. And I, I should remember that more often. That is a gift to sort of at least inhabit um, two worlds. I don't in, inhabit the Chinese one as, as much as the American one, but um, I definitely do have my feet in two worlds. It's interesting what you said about your children. I wonder, do your children, do you think have as much of a connection to their Persian selves or their Persian culture? I'm with my own children, I have a lot of anxiety because it's very difficult for them to pick up the language. My husband is not Chinese, so they don't hear us speak the language and it's not as much a part of their lives mm -hmm. um, as it might be for your kids. I don't know. It's, a, it's not easy. Um, and no, I don't think they feel as attached, obviously, as I do. But um, I think they, they do see the boons. Um, you know, I, I think... Uh, the first time I tried to convince them that um, that it's good to um, speak Persian was when we were on a subway in New York City, and you know there was there was a passenger who looked really funny or was dozing off, you know, uh, on somebody else's shoulder, and I wanted to you know bring their attention uh, to this guy so that we could laugh at him, and <clears throat> and I couldn't do it in English because, you know, it wasn't nice. So I did it in Persian and, and, um, and they suddenly realized that uh, I was saying something inappropriate, but, you know, nobody else knew it was our secret language. And so slowly, um, you know, the, the mother had turned into uh, a person who was teaching them how to misbehave, but that misbehavior was okay if you could do it. <laughs> in a way that uh, didn't offend other people because you were doing it secretly. Um, and so I think I, um, I gave them, you know, the pass uh, to, to say certain things that they shouldn't, I would tell them not to say in front of other people, but, but they were allowed to say it if, if they use the secret language. And then slowly kind of we, um, we established the logic why we need to carry on with this language, which um, fortunately they still speak, even though um, not as well as I wish they had. Yes, I, we try to sell, the, sell Chinese to them as like a secret language. So then it becomes coded as sort of, as you said, misbehavior rather than this moral um, imperative that they should retain, you know, this culture that they don't even remember really. Uh, every potty word, you know, every terrible word of insult, um, you know, that my kid know, kids know in Persian, they learn from me. <laughs> I thought, you know, they, you know, I, I should show them that it can be fun. So all the, right. all the bad words, 
um, I, I introduced to them because I thought if I had no other advantage to all the beautiful cartoons on, on, you know, on television, except that I could uh, give them a language that other people didn't have. Right, absolutely. Who can compete with those cartoons? Nobody. <laughs> So we are um, running a little bit low on time. So I wanted to allow others to uh, throw their questions in the chat if they have them, and then we can ask Roya to answer them. Yeah, or um, thank you both for that absolutely fascinating conversation. I was completely riveted. Um, uh, so I know a lot of people are on mute. You can feel free if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question um, or type it in the chat if you don't feel like asking a question. I have one though that I'd like to ask um, Roya, which is about um, a section of the book that I assume happened with you and your mom um, and the subway. Mm -hmm. um, for people who haven't read the book, um, uh, I mean, Roy, you could tell it better than I can, but but it, I actually was crying um, uh, at the end of that anecdote. Um, uh, um, Roya put her mom on the subway to go back to their home from Manhattan um, and then discovered that the train was not the train she thought. It was, it was on the right tracks, but it was the wrong letter train. Um, and her mother had absolutely no understanding other than the stop she was supposed to be looking for, which wasn't a stop that was going to happen on the train she was on, um, which is something that Roya knew. Um, and uh, um, she, what she was, I think you were terrified um, uh, and tried to report her mother missing, but it, no one is missing after just an hour or two in New York City. Um, and then I get uh, someone, uh, someone who worked for the train company brought her home. A conductor. A conductor. Right. Wait, um, that was a beautiful recap, Cindy. That, but tell more because I, I yeah. just, I could not believe, um, just, a, just, an, just as an anecdote of the immigrant experience and the incredible kindness of this woman, um, uh, in in bringing and bringing your mother home and figuring it out and bringing your mother home, such a selfless act mm -hmm. of of kindness. Um, and and I think your family really was able to communicate to her just how much it meant that, yes, that she did this. You know, yeah, I mean, I think the the one um, missing piece of information is that um, she was African American, and um, so part of the story, the body of the story tells that, you know, when we came as new immigrants, you know, other uh, immigrants uh, from the Iranian community would tell us, oh, be careful, you know, African Americans, you know, they can be dangerous. And, you know, I, I had been a child of the revolution, nothing in my, uh, in the life that I had left behind had been normal so I my my understanding of danger um, was very different from from you know I think ordinary people so I I thought um, you know I thought let me let me experience uh, whatever it is that you're uh, warning me about I'll make up my own mind but that was because you know I've been a rebellious uh, kid who had grown up um, you know I did at a very tumultuous time. So it was a, I was very unusual in that way. But, but then, you know, when that is sort of in the background, my mother gets lost and, you know, instead of going to Brooklyn somewhere to 55th street, she's being, um, she's going to Queens instead. Um, and I'm certain that because she doesn't speak English, she's gonna be lost uh, for days and days. Um, or, or so I thought at the time because she, she couldn't um, talk to anyone to ask for help. Um, and then, you know, I rush home and in about three, four hours, um, she walks home, you know, with her arm in the arm of, a, of an African-American subway conductor. 
and they walk in and my mother was sobbing um, and, you know, because she was so excited and grateful um, and speaking in Persian, by the way, the whole way saying, this woman is a gem. She, she knew I was lost and she said, you just stay on the train until my shift is over and I'm going to deliver you home, which is precisely what she did. And, and so the, you know, the, I, I thought that that was such a, um, such a beautiful act of kindness, but also such an affirmation for me um, because I had uh, come here thinking uh, I don't need um, anybody's prior experiences um, to, to create prejudice in my mind. I, I, want to, um, I want to discover my own America and, and uh, I, I don't want to inherit your, your, uh, your judgments um, about anyone and anything. And, and so when this happened, uh, I felt really, um, I felt rewarded um, for, for thinking the way I thought, even though uh, I was very young and very new. Um, but it was a, a beautiful moment, especially since uh, my mother wouldn't let her go. And, you know, like any good Iranian, she forced her to have dinner with us. And, <laughs> and she had to sit in our living room and, you know, have whatever it was that she had. Uh, cooked in the morning before she had left the house. It was it was a great night. It it it's just such. A, how long had you been in the country when this happened? About six seven weeks. Six seven weeks. Yeah. It's it just I just uh, I love that story. <laughs> I really do. Um, there's a question in the chat from Liz Gagliardi, which is, what did your dad do? Did he eventually come to America or did he stay in Iran? Um, so this is a, a long story, but my father couldn't leave, in part because um, uh, the the new government in Iran, the post-revolutionary government, never made it um, an official policy, but they would not allow Jews to leave. Um, nobody would admit to the fact that Jews were banned. Um, but if a Jewish person asked for uh, his or her passport to be renewed, um, it wouldn't be renewed um, and, uh, or it would be confiscated. Um, and if you asked why, they would say, oh, just come back in three months and then you would go back in three months and then you know, they would tell you to come back in six months and then this would go on, but no one would ever overtly say uh, there's a ban, there was a ban. So um, eventually, um, we paid off, my father paid off somebody in the passport office to, to let my, um, to, to kind of process my mother uh, and my passports. Um, and and uh, so my mother and I were able to leave even though without that, that person's intervention and the bribe we paid, it would not have been possible. But the same person couldn't do um, for my father what he, uh, uh, the same thing for my father. So my father was still in Iran for another four or five years um, after my mother and I had come to the US and he eventually um, crossed the Iranian border on foot into Pakistan. And then um, he then came from Pakistan to the United States. Uh, but it took about five years for him to kind of make this journey. Um, so he did come, but, um, but you know, I think women in general um, make these transitions a lot more uh, easily than men do. So, you know, my father was grumpy and uh, wasn't willing to, um, you know, start learning English or take on a job that was um, you know, less than the work that he had done back at home, which was to be an educator and a principal of, of a school. Um, whereas my mother just rolled with the punches and, uh, and she didn't mind making a fool of herself if she went shopping and, you know, mispronounced things or, um, you know, mixed Persian with some English in order to, um, in order to just do whatever it was that she needed to do. Um, so it was very interesting um, to see the difference between the two of them. Um, 
so he came eventually, but uh, uh, I can't say that he he built a new life for himself. He he just uh, he stayed grumpy and he stayed at home for for the most part. Thank you. That's for that. really I'm interesting. Sure. That go ahead, Debbie. Oh, sorry, Cindy. <laughs> I was just going to say that that gender divide, I think, is really true, at least in my own family. You know, my mother very much was able to find a community here and make friends here and have a new life, whereas my father very much, you know, in his head was still kind of back in China, but not really there and not really here and just sort of very, he became very isolated and very withdrawn because he could never really find his way here. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, Pepe, uh, the, these common experiences uh, were exactly the things I was trying to capture in the book, because, you know, every once in a while, somebody comes along and says, you wrote a book and you think you can speak on behalf of all immigrants. And I keep saying, no, 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 I'm not stupid. I can't speak on behalf of all immigrants, but there are some fundamentally uh, common experiences that I try to capture. And, and, you know, you just spoke to one of them. Should Nancy, we take go one ahead. last question? Yep, I see Nancy's hand up. Nancy, well, go ahead. I, I just wanted to compliment you on the book because I think the, it's very uh, instructive of the people who are not immigrants, <laughs> that when we meet immigrants, and because it does, uh, it has a very gentle tone and the the immigrant speaking is very reasonable and kind of but but this is so confusing kind of thing <laughs> and i just think that that's uh i just want to comment on that that you're that i thought the the whole tone of the book the structure of the book uh, uh and then the tone of it was like was so gentle and so, um, you know, kind of come join us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Nancy, you know who you have to thank for that gentle tone? Who? Oh. Trump. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the more, the more belligerent he came, the more belligerent he came, the gentler. Yeah, no, I you <laughs> right. I, 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 and I so appreciated it. I yeah. just uh, I just appreciated it. Yeah, honestly, you know, I thought you speak against immigrants, you say we're bad, and I am going to prove to you that we are so we're much so, <laughs> we're so reasonable and we, we think through these things. But have you ever thought that this is, you know, no, no, I just loved it. Yeah, no, thank you. Can I say one thing? Yes, sure. Um, of course. I hadn't read the book. I'm so interested now that I've heard you speak you. and you had said one thing as far as your degree of disorientation and you felt that my mind and my thought and my feelings were left behind. It really kind of, it really hit me. Um, I kind of felt that way myself. Um, I am American born, African American, but just the disassociation as far as, I guess with people. Um, I kind of felt that, but I love it. And I will be reading your book. So thank you for that. Very touching, very thank touching you. for me. Thank you. So here's something very interesting. So I used to, you know, I, I used to go to classrooms in college and I would look for the only African-American person I could find or non-white and I would go sit next to them. And, you know, eventually <laughs> somebody I think said to me, wait a minute, you know you're white, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> <What?"> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just that you know. I think our our experience is on the inside, right? Not not on the outside. And on the inside, I felt like you know I, I'm a minority. You know, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm I'm an outsider, and and so these people who are less than the rest, you know, in their numbers, um, you know, who are fewer than other people, then I should, you know, they are my people. I should go hang out with them. And that's really uh, how I 
uh, I saw myself and how I saw myself vis-a-vis the majority community. And so, so much of what be, is being discussed as race, you know, where people say white and non-white, you know, I was, I guess I was perfectly white looking, but I wasn't feeling white on the inside. Experience was totally different. And I think that's the similarities and experiences. Yeah, exactly. Similarities. So I really appreciate mm. it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I will be reading your book. <laughs> yeah, you'll like it. And, and, and read her memoir too. Yes, I wrote it down, definitely. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Well, thank you all so much for I, I uh, for this wonderful, Roya, there's this gushing in the uh, comments in the chat about uh, how wonderful the fabulous the, the discussion you. was. Um, remember everybody, you all have my email address now. If you'd like Roya to sign a copy of the book, just, just let me know and I will get that done for you. Um, Roya, I will make a date with you, which I'm looking forward to already. And I would um, love to Debbie, with Debbie too. Yes, yes, I would love if you too. would find my book, Roy. Since you're in town all the time, I'm sure we'll be able to find a, we'll, a We will figure that out. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for making the time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Be safe in this weather. Take good care of yourself um, in this uncertain time. And have a very good evening. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Roya. Yeah.